Hello and welcome to the Talesian's lectures on the mathematical prerequisites of machine learning. Today we start by looking at set theory and proofs. Now, the way mathematics is usually taught at school, it is usually taught by example. Pupils are asked to learn the various mathematical laws by rote. For example, we all know from school that 3 plus 5 is equal to 8. And we all know from school that the derivative of x squared is 2x. But we rarely pause and ask why is this the case and what are we really doing when we are writing down these formally. In fact, a lot is going on in these equations. For example, we would have to spend a lot of time explaining what dx really is in this equation, where we say that the derivative of x squared is 2x. We would either have to introduce the notion of an infinitesimal, which is what dx actually is, or resort to Sylvanus Thompson's explanation from Calculus Made Easy that dx means a little bit of x. Now this explanation may be sufficient if all we want to do is do mathematics rather than understand it. Indeed, Thompson uses the ancient Simeon proverb as an epigraph to his work Calculus Made Easy, what one fool can do, another can. And this is a portrait of uh, the author of this work, of uh, Sylvanus Thompson. However, what we are doing, what is mathematics anyway? Mathematics is not your typical logi or ology, like biology, geology. Unlike many of the sciences, the word itself comes from the ancient Greek mathematikos, which means fond of learning. But what are we really learning in mathematics? What is the entire subject about? So we have come for, to, to understand that mathematics from the etymology of the word, from the origin of the word, is a form of learning. But this definition is almost as abstract as mathematics itself. Can we do better? It is probably G. H. Hardy in A Mathematician's Apology who defined mathematics as the study of patterns. A mathematician like a painter or a poet is a maker of patterns and if his patterns are more permanent than theirs it is because they are made with ideas. Here is another quote by Hardy. I believe that mathematical reality lies outside us, that our function is to discover and observe it and that the theorems which we prove and which we describe grandiloquently as our creations are simply the notes of our observations. Now, Hardy was not the only person to describe mathematics as the science of patterns. Here we have um, Lindstein, who is saying that mathematics is often defined as the science of space and number, as the discipline rooted in geometry and arithmetic, although the diversity of modern mathematics has always exceeded has always exceeded um, this definition. It was not until the recent resonance of uh, computers and uh, mathematics that a more apt definition became um, fully evident. Mathematics is the science of patterns. The mathematician seeks patterns in number, in space, in computers and in imagination. According to this definition, mathematics is a study of patterns and patterns are more general than numbers. In, in fact, they somehow precede numbers. Patterns is something that happens before we even discover numbers. There are patterns already. Therefore, a number cannot be the most basic unit of study in mathematics. Then what is the most basic unit of study in mathematics? What abstraction could we introduce to study patterns in all their various forms, including numbers? This was an open question for a very long time until in 1874, Georg Cantor introduced just such an abstraction in his paper entitled On the Property of the Collection of All Real Algebraic Numbers. He introduced the set. It has proved to be an extremely fruitful abstraction allowing us, among other things, to formalize the notion of infinity. Thus we begin the study of set theory, an essential prerequisite to most of modern mathematics, to all of modern mathematics, including machine learning. So what is a set? A set 
is a collection of distinct objects. For example, we can talk about a set of 10 numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We define this set by listing its elements and we call it by a particular letter, in this case S. We refer to objects in a particular set as its elements. We have just defined a set by enumerating, by listing its elements. Thus, 3 is an element of S and we write 3 belongs to S. On the other hand, 11 is not an element of S. Thus we write 11 does not belong to S. This is the set theoretic notation for belongs to and does not belong to. Nor does Joe belong to this set. We see that there is no Joe here, so Joe does not belong to S. As we can see, the elements of a set don't have to be numbers. Joe could belong to some set, uh, but not the one that we have just defined. He does not belong to the set S. This particular set that we just introduced, the set S, is finite. We have only finitely many elements in S. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and that is it. There are no more elements in S. Now consider the set of all natural numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. We have to continue indefinitely in order to enumerate the elements of natural numbers. There is no way to list all of its elements. We could do it if we had an infinite amount of time, but we don't. So we could just um, say that this set is infinite, and indeed it is infinite, it goes on forever. But it is countably infinite, because we can enumerate its elements. We can start 1, 2, 3, 4, and if we actually had an infinite amount of time, we would have enumerated all the elements of the set of natural numbers. And there is this special um, letter N that is used in mathematics to denote the set of natural numbers. So it is countably infinite, or denumerable, as people say, because we can, even though it's infinite, if we had an infinite amount of time, we could list all its elements, we could enumerate all its elements. That's why it's called countably infinite, or denumerable. Now, two sets, A and B, are said to be equivalent or equinumerous, and we write A tilde B, if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between those sets, if we could come up with such a correspondence. So, suppose that you have a set A, consisting of elements 1, 2, and 3, and another set, B, with elements A, B, and C. So what we could do, we could set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between these sets. So we say 1 corresponds to A, 2 corresponds to B, and 3 corresponds to C. This is not the only way in which we could do it. We could say that 1 corresponds to B, 2 corresponds to A, 3 corresponds to C. But exactly for every single element of A, there is exactly one element of B, and it's a unique element. And for every element of A, there is exactly one element of B, and it's, it's a unique element. Right. That is why we have a one-to-one -one correspondence in this case. Now consider the sets A of elements 1 and 2, and B consisting of elements A, B, and C. Would you be able to put those elements in one-to-one -one correspondence? What do you think? No, we wouldn't be able. No, okay. And that is why, why is it the case? Because they have different number of elements, right? If you try to write, okay, one corresponds to A, two corresponds to B, but, uh, okay, what corresponds to C in that case, right? We, we've run out of elements and we cannot reuse elements, right? So these two sets are not equivalent, or not equinumerous, as we say. Indeed, finite sets are equinumerous if and only if they have exactly the same number of elements. In fact, equivalence or equinumer uh, equivalence is a generalization of this notion of the number of elements to infinite sets, and we'll see in what way. Every countably infinite or denumerable set 
can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers. So it is equivalent to natural numbers. Because if we have such a set, we can just enumerate its elements and say number one corresponds to the first element of the set, number two corresponds to the next element of the set, and so on. So you can see that when we enumerate something that is enumerable, we are in fact putting it in one-to-one -one correspondence to natural numbers. Natural numbers one, two, three, four, five, and so on and so forth. Right? So countably infinite or denumerable sets are all equivalent in the sense that we have just described to natural numbers. Now, what about rational numbers? Rational numbers are fractions, simple fractions, where you have the numerator p and the denumerator, the denumerator q, um, sorry, denominator q. Uh, q is not zero. Now let us just look at positive rational numbers where um, the uh, numerator and um, uh, denominator are both, um, are both natural numbers. And, and let us look at these positive rational fractions. Uh, do you think the set is denumerable? Is it obvious? No. It's not entirely obvious. Well, let us have a look at is Can we actually enumerate all fractions? Could I say a half, a quarter, and so on? Could I do, can, I, can I do this for all fractions? Can I put them in correspondence with natural numbers? Well, let us see. Okay, let us see. Let us come up with the following table. First of all, we have our numerator p, we have our de de denominator q. Let us put, create a table with all possible numerators, which are going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, and all possible denominators q, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And let me write down the fractions that I obtain in this way. We get a two-dimensional table. Now this table, if I were able to continue this table indefinitely where I have the dot dot dot, this table would contain all rational numbers, which is all fractions of the form p over q. We're talking about the positive ones because um, these guys are assumed to be positive, right? But that is not that terribly important. We could equally do this with negative fractions, but let us focus on positive fractions for now. So we have created this two-dimensional table 1 over 1, 2 over 1, 3 over 1, 4 over 1, 5 over 1, 1 over 2, 2 over 2, 3 over 2, 4 over 2, 5 over 2, and so on and so on. Right, so by doing this we could enumerate every single fraction. Now we have a problem I said we need to, for the set to be denumerable, it needs to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers, which means we cannot have any repeats. Now, in this table, we do have repeats because 1 over 1, which is 1, is equal to 2 over 2. It's actually the same number. And 2 quarters is actually the same as a half, right? Because if we express this fraction in, simple, in its lowest terms, it's going to be a half. Right. So, what, is this a huge problem? What we can do as the next step, we can remove these duplicates. We only keep the first occurrence of a number. Right? We could do this. So we keep 1, but we delete 2 over 2. We do keep a half, but we delete 2 over 4 because it's actually equal to a half. And in this way, we have removed from this table all duplicates. Right? That's our second step. Now, but it's a two-dimensional table, right? We, we have two dimensions, we go this way and that way, so how do we put these numbers in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers? One, two, three, four, five. Well, here's how we do this. We just follow the arrows. One corresponds to one over one, which is actually one. Two corresponds to a half. 3 corresponds to 2, 4 corresponds to 3, 5 corresponds to a third, 6 corresponds to a quarter, 7 corresponds to 2 thirds, 8, 3 over 2, 9, 4 over 1, 10, 5 over 1, 11, 1 over 5, and so on. You see, I have just put the elements of this set of rational 
numbers of fractions, positive fractions, um, in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers. We have to follow the arrows here in this way, so we have to, have to follow this kind of winding pattern in this table. But you can see, in fact, set theoretically, the, the set of positive rationals is equivalent to the set of natural numbers. In fact, it contains the same number of elements. Now, we're talking about infinite sets here, right? But the reason we regard them set theoretically as having the same number of elements is because they can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other, right? So, in some sense, they represent the same kind of infinity, right? But um, we could quite easily do the same for negative rational numbers. All we need to do is repeat our exercise with the um, minus sign in front of the fraction, and we could also show that negative rational numbers also are equivalent to natural numbers, so the set is denumerable. Okay, but we know that not every single number can be written as a fraction. Pi, for example, is a decimal fraction with, a, with an infinite decimal expansion. We can never actually write down all, you know, the, all, we, we cannot exhaust the um, decimal expansion of pi, and we cannot write it as p over q. Nor can we write root 2 as p over q. Right? We'll come back to that a little bit later in this lecture, but trust me for now, you cannot write root 2, the square root of 2, as p over q, in the way we have done this with a half, for example, or a third. And another number that is, these numbers are known as irrational. Another number that is irrational is the well-known number e, 2.71 and so on. So this number is irrational as well. So if we take all these numbers, this will give us the set of real numbers. Now here is a question. Is the set of real numbers, which includes all the, um, all the rationals, is it possible to enumerate this particular set? So who thinks it's possible? In some sense it could be possible. Well, who thinks it's not possible? All right, okay, well let us, let us have a look at this. Let us consider all the rational numbers between 0 and 1. Let us just look at these ones, yeah, because if we cannot enumerate these ones, we, there is no, no, no way we can enumerate all rational, all real numbers, I'm sorry, all real numbers. It is well known that every real number can be written as possibly infinite decimal fraction. Not a simple fraction like p over q, but it will have a decimal expansion. If it's 1 over 2, for example, which is a rational number, then we would have, in that case, we would have a periodic decimal expansion, or we would have just a finite dec decimal expansion, which is 0 0.5. 1 over 2 is 0 0.5, right? But we could not actually have, we could not do the same for pi. We could not have a finite or periodic decimal expansion, but we could still write it down. Now, suppose we list all of these real numbers in in, you know, pi is actually just outside the 0 to 1. Suppose we're just dealing with the numbers that fall between 0 and 1. So they will have 0 point some decimal expansion. So suppose we have enumerated all of them here. Suppose I've done this, right? Suppose I have enumerated, then I can say 1 is a1, which is not point a11, a12, a13, a14, a15. 2 corresponds to A2, which is not point A21, A22, A23, A24, A25. 3, A3, which is not point A31, A32, A33, A34, A35. And these A's are just some digits, right? A11 is a particular digit from 0 to 9. So it's either 0 or 1 or 2, 3, 4, up to 9, right? So these are all single digits, yeah? So suppose I've done this. Suppose I've listed all real numbers. Suppose I've enumerated them, right? So that, that's it, right? I've just uh, proved that uh, these uh, real numbers are equivalent to natural numbers, therefore the set is denumerable or countably infinite. But that's not actually the case. So 
Consider this number. Let us call this number B. I'm going to construct such a number. Let us look at the first number on our list, the first digit, A11, which may be, I don't know, 2. All I'm going to do for the first digit of our number B, I'm going to, to pick a, a, something different than this particular digit, than A11. So if A11 is 2, I'm going to take 3, for example. Then I look at the next number. I look at the second digit in the second number, and I pick a different digit. Right, so for example, if A22 happens to be 2, I pick 5. Then I move on to the next number on my list, the third number, look at the third digit of the third number, and change it to something else. Right, so if it happens to be 3, I pick 1, you know, I have choices, right? I can, I, can, I can pick any digit other than 3 in that case. And I do this for every single number on my list to obtain a number B, which is between 0 and 1. It's a real number, right? But this real number differs from every single number on my list by construction. So it cannot possibly be on my list. You see? I have just proved that it is impossible to enumerate all, sorry, that it is impossible to enumerate real numbers. You see? This is a very elegant, um, very elegant proof. This proof shows that real numbers, well, if we, we cannot enumerate all numbers, all real numbers from 0 to 1, there is no way we can enumerate all real numbers, because we can't even enumerate the ones between 0 and 1. What's, what chance do we stand to enumerate any other, or the rest of them, right? So, the argument that we have just employed is known as Cantor's diagonal slash argument. It's due to the father of uh, set theory, Georg Cantor, um, who discovered this diagonal slash. It's diagonal slash for obvious reasons, because we make a list and then we slash through it diagonally. Right, and it's Cantor's because it was discovered by him. Incidentally, Cantor's set theory, which is what we are looking at at the moment, which is the foundation of modern mathematics, was frowned upon many of Cantor's contemporaries. Cantor formalized, as you can see, the notion of infinity. Now we can see that real numbers are infinite and they're somehow more infinite than fractions. So there are different kinds of infinities. Fractions and natural numbers are equivalent, so they, they, they are infinite in the same kind of sense, but real numbers are bigger. We cannot enumerate them, so it's a different kind of infinity. So we're looking, in fact, at a sort of hierarchy of different infinities. Now, we're only touching on the subject. You see, all we're doing, we're just introducing sets. But you see how many different ideas, how many powerful ideas, very deep mathematical ideas, occur when you start by looking at sets. Not everyone liked set theory as it was developed by Cantor. Uh, in fact, uh, Kronecker used to say, I don't know what predominates in Cantor's theory, philosophy or theology, but I am sure that there is no mathematics there. It's a bit ironic because modern mathematics is in fact based on set theory. Thus the set R, again we use this funny R, um, those of you who use LaTeX to uh, typeset their mathematics, it's the MathBB R, in, which looks like this. Um, just like the set N is infinite, but it is somehow more infinite than this set. Right? In order to fully understand these different kinds of infinities, we really need to introduce the notion of cardinality, which is outside the scope of this introduction to set theory. So we'll carry on. Subsets and supersets. Notice that all elements of our example set S, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, are also elements of natural numbers. They're all, they all happen to be natural numbers. Therefore, we can say that S is a subset of natural numbers. It's not true, though, that every natural number is an S, right? 11, for example, is not an S. Therefore, we say that N is not a subset of S. We could equivalently say that N is a superset 
of S. And of course, S is not a superset of N. And this is the set theoretic notation that we use to um, signify these notions, subset and superset. So N is a subset of R. Natural numbers are a subset of real numbers, as are in fact rational numbers that we have considered the fractions, the simple fractions, are also a subset of real numbers. But real numbers are not a subset of natural numbers. And natural numbers are not a superset of real numbers. Since S is a subset of N, we could use the following syntactic sugar to define S. We could say that S is the set of those natural numbers that are less than or equal to 10. You see, we put this line here, and then we write down the property of the elements of S. This is another way to define the set. We don't have to enumerate every single element. And this syntactic sugar, this line, syntactic sugar is just a notational trick to make it easier to define something, to write something down. So this line can be read as such as or such that. So you can see that sets can be defined by some characteristic properties of the elements. We also say that there are exactly 10 elements in our example set S which we defined here. And the notation for that is, okay, in this case when we write a line we don't mean such that. We, we put the name of the set between those two lines and write the number of elements. Right? So we're actually saying that there are 10 elements in S, exactly 10 elements in S. Now, two sets A and B are equal when they have exactly the same elements. In other words, when A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. We shall add that when we are looking at sets, we do not consider duplicates as distinct elements. So when we write something like this, we really mean a set consisting a single element too, right? Um, nor do we care about the order of elements in the set. 1, 2, 3, and 3, 2, 1. If, we, if those are elements of, of these two sets, these are again the same set, right? They contain exactly the same elements. The order is unimportant. However, we distinguish sets consisting elements from elements themselves. Now, we call a set consisting a single element a singleton set. Now, this is a singleton set containing one element, 5. It's not the same as just the element 5. Right? We cannot really... 5 belongs to this set. 5 belongs to it. 5 also belongs to A, right? whereas the set containing 5 does not belong to A. Right? A just contains 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It does not contain a set containing 5, if you see what I mean. Okay. In the programming language Python, there is a data structure called set. Now, those of you who do not program in Python can, for now, disregard what I'm going to say. In Python, there is a data structure called set, which mimics the mathematical notion of a set. We can define a particular set, A, by listing its elements, just as we did mathematically. And then we can, when we enter A in Jupyter, we get back the string representation of A. Um, we can ask Python if the set 234 is a subset of A, and Python says, yes, it is. We can ask Python if A is a subset of the set containing elements 234, and Python will say, no, it isn't. False. We can ask Python if this set containing elements 2, 3, and 4, consisting of elements 2, 3, and 4, is equal to A, and Python will say, no, it's not. And we can ask if the set consisting of elements 1, 2, and 3, and the set consisting of elements 3, 2, and 1, if those two sets are equal, and Python knows that the order is unimportant for sets, and it will say, yes, they are. We can also say, is the set two consisting of elements 2 and 2 equal to the set consisting of just 2? And Python will say, yes, 
because we only look at distinct elements when considering sets. Right? So this, those two sets are the same. Right? And when we ask Python to print out the set consisting of elements 2 and again 2, it will just print out a single 2. And the length of the set is going to be 1. Okay. If we have the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 1, 1, how many elements does it contain? 10. That's right. It contains, it's, it's equal to the set A, and it contains exactly 10 elements. Now, elements of sets don't have to be numbers. We, in Python, we can define a set which c contains strings, uh, integers, fractions, and so on. We can mix them together in a single set. Okay, so Python's data structure set mimics the mathematical idea, the mathematical notion of a set. We have considered, when looking at real numbers, a particular kind of argument to show that real numbers are not uh, not denumerable, that we cannot enumerate them. We first assumed that we could do it, we tried to list all the real numbers between 0 and 1, and then we arrived at a contradiction. We said, okay, so this set contains all real numbers between 0 and 1, but wait a second, no they don't. I can construct such a real number that is between 0 and 1, but it, it is not in our list. So our assumption that all real numbers between 0 and 1 have been enumerated is false. So we have arrived at a contradiction. This particular technique is extremely powerful. It's called proof by contradiction, or in Latin, reductio ad absurdum. According to G. H. Hardy, it is a far finer gambit than any chess gambit. A chess player may offer the sacrifice of a pawn or even a piece, but a mathematician offers the game. This is the power of the proof by contradiction. Here is another example. Recall that a prime is a natural number greater than one that cannot be formed by multiplying two smaller natural numbers. So the first few primes are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, and so on. Now, um, we can quickly use Python to come up with a list of even more primes. So, what's the prime after 23, by the way? What's the next prime? So 24 is not a prime, right? It can be divided by 3, is right? 29. 29, right? Because 25 is divisible by 5, 26 is divisible by 13, for example, by 2, right? 27 is divisible by 3. 31. 28 is divisible by 2. 29 is a prime. 31 is a prime. So we can ask Python, using Python's extremely powerful list comprehension, so we can say, okay, Look at x's in ranges from 2 to 100 and only keep those x's that don't have, that are not divisible by smaller num, uh, by, by y which is in range 2 up to x, exclusive in this case. Right, so it's including 2 but excluding x. Because obviously x is divisible by x. And it will list all the primes up to exclusively. <laughs> I, I, up to 99, inc including 99. Right, and that, thus we have 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, you're right, 31, 37, 41, 43, 47, 53, 59, 61, 67, 71, 73, 79, 83, 89, 97. Now, if I continue, it will be way too boring. I think it's already quite boring now that I've enumerated all the primes up to 100. So let us keep moving. Now, are there infinitely many primes, or are there finitely many primes? Well, there are infinitely many primes. How do we prove that there are infinitely many primes? Of course, 
bearing in mind that we are talking about proofs by contradiction, we first of all, to prove that there are infinitely many primes by contradiction, we assume that there are that there are finitely many primes, just finitely many primes. Well, they, they will be, of course, countably infinite because natural numbers are countably infinite, denumerable, and therefore primes are at most countably infinite, but they could be finite. Now, let us assume that there are only finitely many primes. In this case, they are going to be represented by, by this finite set of these primes. Let us assume that there are n of them, right? So this is, according to our assumption, this is the set of all primes, p1, p2, p3, up to pn. Okay? Now let us, well, I'm telling you that there are infinitely many primes. Let us arrive at a contradiction. How do we do this? Let us multiply all these primes together, like this. We multiply them all together, and we add 1 to this number. Okay, now, this number is greater than any number on our list, on, 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 in this set. It's greater than any of these numbers, because we, it's obtained by multiplying all these primes and adding 1 to it. Now, we just said that these are all the primes in existence, right? So, is this number a prime? Well, since it's greater than all the elements of P, it cannot be a prime, right? So, therefore, since it is not a prime, it is going to be this number that we just picked by multiplying all the primes and adding 1. This number can be represented as some prime on this list, because this is the list of all primes, times some natural number. Right? And this natural number is supposed to be different from 1, because this, this, this number is... Otherwise, it would be one of the numbers on our list. So, this number b here is going to be greater than 1. Okay? But then, rearranging this equation, 1 can be written as a minus this product of primes, so 1 can be written as a minus, we take this to the other side, th this product of primes. We have just represented a as pk times b. Now, this number here, this number here, also contains the prime factor pk, so we can factor it out. Right, so we can factor out pk, which will leave us with b minus, and then there is a product of all primes apart from pk. So we've just taken it outside the brackets. But what we have just shown, and this number is clearly um, a different, uh, different from 1, um, we have just shown that our prime number, pk, divides 1. But now, now that's a contradiction, because the only natural number that actually divides 1 is 1 itself. Right? 2 doesn't divide 1, 3 doesn't divide 1, and so on and so forth. So we have arrived at a contradiction. Right? So we have shown, because our assumption that there are finitely many primes is wrong, there must be infinitely many primes. And because primes are a subset of natural numbers, there are denumerably many or countably many primes. Okay? Now, this proof is um, another example. It's another example of a proof by contradiction. Here is another example. We mentioned that um, square root of 2 is irrational. That we cannot write square root of 2 as a simple fraction, p over q. How do we prove this by contradiction? What do we start by doing? Well, we assume for a contradiction that the square root of 2 can be written as p over q. Right? That's our first step. And, uh, of course, q is going to be not equal to 0. Now, the next assumption is that this is the fraction in its lowest terms. That is, you know, if it were, for example, 4 over 2, we, we would be able to cancel. 4 over 2, it would be just 2 over 1. Right? So we say that p and q do not have 
Um, there, are no prime, there is no prime that divides both P and Q. We can cancel it out, right? So this is a fraction in its lowest terms. So square root of 2 can be written as P over Q in lowest terms. Now, then what we do, we take this square root of 2 equals to P over Q, we square both sides, obtaining 2 equals P squared over Q squared. Hence, P squared equals 2 times Q squared. Now, the right-hand side of this equation is clearly even, right? Because it's divisible by 2. Therefore, the left-hand side must be even. Therefore, P squared must be even. Now, for a square of a number to be even, the number itself must be even. Therefore, P must be even, right? We have just concluded that P is even. Therefore, we can write it as 2 times some integer a, so we have p equals 2 times a, right? We then substitute this into the equation, so p squared is going to be 4 times a squared, so 4 times a squared is equal to 2q squared. Now we can uh, divide both sides of this equation by 2, then we obtain q squared is equal to 2a squared, therefore q squared is even, and therefore q itself must be even. Now we have arrived at the contradiction. We said that this is a fraction in its lowest terms, but both P and Q are even. That cannot be the case. Okay, so we have just proved that square root of 2 cannot be written as P over Q. So it's not a rational number, so it is an irrational number. This is another application of this very powerful technique, proof by contradiction. That square root of 2 is irrational was discovered by Pythagoras. And since Pythagoreans were actually mystics, the discovery of irrational numbers is said to have dealt a huge blow to their worldview. They initially thought that nature was harmonious and that every number could be written as p over q in for some p and some q, uh, not equal to zero. So it is even rumored that Hippasus of Metapontum who divulged this secret that there exists this weird number square root of 2 which cannot be written as a fraction. It is said that he was he drowned at sea as punishment from gods for divulging this hideous secret. And this is a 19th century portrait of um, Hippasus. All right. Now so far, so good. We said that set theory, this is the foundation of all of modern mathematics. We have said many nice things about set theory. But let us consider some problems. By the way, the set theory that we are looking at right now uh, is called naive set theory. And if you want, it's, we are talking about it very informally. The formal way to talk about it is through axioms and a much more complex, much more, much more rigorous philosophical argument. If you want to look at a good introduction to naive set theory, you can read a book by this man, by Paul Halmus, called Naive Set Theory. But okay, let us look at some problems with naive set theory. Okay, I'm going to define a particular set. I'm going to define a set consisting of all sets that are not elements of themselves. Now it takes a little while to really understand this, but in set theoretic notation, R is going to be a set of sets that are not elements of themselves. And I'm going to ask you this question. Is R an element of itself? Now, suppose that R is indeed an element of itself then R belongs to R. Then R should belong to R. But hang on a second. It violates this condition. R must not belong to R. So if R is in R, it cannot be in R. Now, suppose that R is not an element of itself. Now, that means R is not in R. Okay, but if R is not in R, this condition here is actually true. You know, we can substitute R for this X. X is not in X, R is not in R, that, that fits. Therefore, R must be in R, because all sets that are not elements of themselves are in R. 
So we have arrived at a contradiction. We cannot say that R is in R or R is not in R. It's actually more than just a contradiction, it's a paradox. And this is a paradox that baffled the creators of naive set theory, including Halmus. This paradox was discovered by Bertrand Russell, and it bears his name. Bertrand Russell found this paradox in 1901, and people who were trying to create this solid logical foundation of mathematics were really quite shocked by this discovery. In fact, a lot of very sophisticated mathematical work needed to be done to save set theory and to deal with Russell's paradox and some other paradoxes that were discovered in set theory. And it has led to the creation of what is nowadays known as ermela frankeli set theory, or ZFC. So when we talk about set theory in the modern context, we assume that we are talking about the zermela frankel set theory. Now, how zermela frankel set theory deals with this paradox is outside the scope of our presentation. Okay, but believe me, the rest of it should work, right? But you have discovered this relatively innocent field of mathematics contains many interesting and challenging paradoxes. And this is the foundation of all of mathematics. Now, the union of two sets, A and B, is the set of elements which are in A, in B, or in both A and B. Right? So, for example, if A is the set consisting of 1, 2, and 3, and B consists of 2, 4, and 5, then the union is the set consisting of elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right? We can check that in Python, if we define a set consisting of elements 3, 5, 7, 9, and another set B consisting of elements 1, 2, 3, then the union is going to be the set consisting of these elements. 1, because it's in B, 2 is in B, 3 is in both A and B, so it's going to be there, 5 is in A, 7 is in A, and 9 is in A. Okay, so we have combined, the, we, we obtained the set that combines all elements of A and all elements of B. Now, the intersection of two sets, A and B, is the set of elements which are in A and which are also in B. We write in set theoretic notation like so. The sign for intersection is this, is like that, and it's, and it's if you like, the upturned sign for the union. So if you want to re remember, union is very inclusive, is a little bit, it's a little bit like a cup that includes everything, that tries to embrace everything, which is, which is uh, properly put on the table. Now, if you want to exclude, be much more exclusive, you take the intersection, so you turn it upside down. Okay. Now, in Python, we can check for those sets A, 3, 5, 7, 9, and B, 1, 2, 3, what is going to be the intersection? Three. It's the set containing 3. Oh, yes. There we go. It's the set containing 3. All right. Venn diagrams are extremely helpful for visualizing such things as unions and intersections of sets. In Python, you can use this package, matplotlib underscore Venn, to produce very beautiful um, Venn diagrams. So, a, diagrammatically, you, re, you can represent the intersection of sets A and B. So, if we represent the sets as, as these circles, then diagrammatically, the intersection is going to be this section here where the circles intersect. And this is the Python code that we use to produce this diagram using this matplotlib underscore Venn package. Now, the intersection of sets A and B is shown here in color, right? The intersection, sorry, the union, I'm very sorry. So if this is the intersection of A and B, then the union of A and B is going to be this thing here. Venn diagrams were invented by the English logician John Venn, and at Cambridge there is even a stained glass, which is a Venn diagram commemorating, um, commemorating his work and life. Now here is another example. Consider the set of all Greek uppercase letter glyphs, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on, of all, another set, E, of all uppercase English letter glyphs, A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And another set R of Russian uppercase letter glyphs, uh, glyphs 
and so on. Right? So the intersection, G intersection, E intersection, R, so you can see that we can take an intersection of more than just two sets, is represented on this Venn diagram by this part here. Right? So these are the Greek um, letter glyphs, these are the English ones, and these are the Russian ones. So there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 glyphs or shapes of letters that are common to the three alphabets. And they are O, M, K, T, A, X, or H, or Xi, uh, Y, or Y, H, B, E, P. Well, we, we use the English names of the glyphs, but uh, there we go. Uh, so you can see them on the Venn diagram here. And of course, this section here, in this section here, you have the correspondence between the, 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 the English and the Greek, but, but, but there are no corresponding letters in the Russian alphabet. And here, this is the letter that exists in Greek and Russian, but not in English. And here, these are the letters that exist in Russian and Greek, but not in English. Did I say this right? Yes, I think so. Okay. Now, um, we can take unions and intersections of infinitely many sets. Right, we have just taken an intersection of three sets. Right, but suppose we have a set of all multiples of two, we'll call it n2. Suppose we have another set, n3, of all multiples of three, and so on. So we can write natural numbers as the union of the set cont con containing one and a countably infinite union of ni's, n2, n3, n4, and so forth. Right, so we can take unions of, in this case we can enumerate these things here, so it's a countable union, it's an infinite union, but it's a countable because we can say it's a union of n2, n3, n4, and so on, but it's also possible to take uh, uncountable or arbitrary unions. Right, it's not going to be necessary in this particular lecture, but it's possible to do that. Okay, so we can have arbitrary unions and we can have arbitrary intersections, meaning we can take arbitra arbitrarily infinitely many sets in unions and intersections. Unions and intersections are connected by these formally. So we can just, as in arithmetic, we can write down different formulae for these things, so can we, so can we work with formulae in set theory. Okay. Uh, but um, another very useful operation on sets is the set difference. The difference between sets A and B is the set of those elements that are in A that are not also in B. Right, so we take all elements of A and then we throw away the elements of B and we obtain this set A intersection B, uh, sorry, A uh, set difference B. A set difference B. Now, if there is some if we think that there is some big set that contains all elements and all the sets that we are considering are subsets of this set, in a sense this is the universal set, but defining a universal set poses certain set theoretic diff difficulties. We can, instead of writing, and suppose that this big set is omega, instead of writing omega set difference A, we can write a complement. We assume that it's omega set minus a. Right. Now, there are some very powerful logical formulae. Actually, well, since logic is related to set theory, but let us leave logic out for now. Set theoretic formulae, which are called de Morgan's laws. Right. So the complement of a union b is equal to a complement intersected with b complement. And the complement of a intersection b is equal to a complement union with B complement. Right. Um, here is an exercise for you. We're not going to do this right now. You can do it in your own time. How would you prove De Morgan's laws? In order to prove that this is true, you assume that a particular element belongs to the set on the left hand side and then deduce that it also belongs to the set on the right hand side. Therefore, because you picked an arbitrary element, it means all elements of this set are also elements of this set. Therefore, this set is a subset of the set on the right hand side. Then you assume that 
some element belongs to the set on the right hand side and show that this element also belongs to the set on the left hand side. Thus you have shown that this set on the right hand side is a subset of the set on the left hand side. Now since the set on the left hand side is a subset of the set on the right hand side and since the set on the right hand side is a subset of the set on the left hand side the two sets are equal. That's how you prove these things. Um, okay. Cartesian products. This is another powerful thing you can do with sets. So you can take two sets, A and B, and you can form a new set, A cross B, or A Cartesian product with B, by taking all ordered pairs of elements, A and B, where A belongs to the set capital A and B belongs to the set capital B. For example, suppose we have a set A consisting of elements 4, bar and baz, and another set B consisting of elements 3 and 12, the Cartesian product of sets A into section B is going to be the set of pairs Fu3, bar 3, bas 3, Fu12, bar 12, bas 12. Right? So these pairs are now elements of this Cartesian product. The reason we call it a product is because in the Cartesian product there are, well, there are three elements in A, there are two elements in B, and there are going to be three times two elements in A times B. So it behaves a little bit like a product. So there are now six elements in A times B. And then as another example, consider the set of real numbers and take a Cartesian product with itself. So you get a pair of, sorry, a set of pairs x, y, where x is a real number and y is a real number. Now that's precisely the set of all Cartesian coordinates on the plane. So the Cartesian plane is just a Cartesian product of the real line with itself. Right? So this is a real number, this is a real number. You take a product of the real line with itself and you obtain the Cartesian plane. And of course you can take Cartesian products of more than two sets. So to obtain the uh, three-dimensional space you take uh, what Cartesian product? You take R times R times R, right? And you get the three-dimensional space, and this is the, um, the portrait of René Descartes, the creator, if you like, of modern, um, uh, of, of including Cartesian products, the idea of graphs, and many other modern ideas behind um, classical modern mathematics. Um, okay, functions. A binary relation R between a set X we'll call it the set of departure, and another set Y, the set of destination or codomain, is specified by its graph, which is exactly the Cartesian product, it, which is a subset, I'm sorry, of Cartesian product, X, X with Y. So the binary relation is also known as a mapping or correspondence. We say, if X and Y are in this set called, called graph of ordered pairs of X and Y, we say that X is R related to Y, and we denote it in this manner here. The order is important. X R Y does not necessarily imply Y R X for a particular binary relation. For some relations it may, for others it may not. Now, if R is a binary relation between X and Y, then the set of those elements of Y um, for which there is some X in X such that X R Y is called the image or range of R. Now the set of those x for which there is some y, such as x r y, is called the domain of r. A function f from set x to set y is a special case of a binary relation. So it's a binary relation such that for every single element in x, there corresponds one and only one pair x y in g in the graph. Now, in order to make this more concrete, let us consider these examples. Suppose we have sets A and B, right? The set A consists of elements 1 and 2. The set B consists of elements A, B and C. We are going to define a binary relation on these two sets by means of this graph or equivalently by, the, by means of this table. It will contain Y, R, B, and two, one is related to B and two is related to A. Okay, so 
this binary relation effectively maps 1 to B and it maps 2 to A. Okay, now here is a question. Is this binary relation defined by this table between A and B a function between A and B? And you remember that a function is a special case of a binary relation. A function is a binary relation. A function f from x to y is the kind of binary relation such that it maps every single element in x to exactly one element of y. Okay, so is this a function? Does it map every single element of A? Of a? Well, yes, of A, yes. But of A, that's right, but that's all we need. Okay. We just need, it does map every single element of A to something, 1 and 2. It does map 1 to B, it does map 2 to A. Okay, so it does map every element of A. Are there any elements that are mapped to different things? Is, for example, if, if one were, if we had two rows, 1, B, and if there was another row, 1, A, this wouldn't be a function, because there would be repeats. Right, but because every single element of A is mapped to exactly one element of B, this is in fact a function. You see, this binary relation defined by this graph, equivalent to this table, is a function. Okay. Now, how about this? We still have our sets A consisting of elements 1 and 2, and B consisting of elements A, B and C. How about this set? Um, is the binary relation G defined by this graph, 1B, 1A, 2A, or equivalent to this table? 1 is mapped to B, 1 is mapped to A, 2 is mapped to A. Is this a function? No. Why not? Because um, a specific element of uh, the first set is, um, is related to two different uh, Elements of the second set. That's right. We have a we have one here occurs in these two rows. One is mapped to both B and A, therefore it's not a function. Okay? Even though every single element of A is mapped to something, but the problem is one is actually mapped to both B and A. So this binary relation is not a function. That's right. Okay, now how about this? Is the binary relation H defined by the graph? 2a, which means 2 is mapped to a, a function. No, because there is no, there is no. 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 Because there is an element from a that is not related to anything. In fact, one is not mapped to anything else, so this is not a function. Okay, so it's not. You see, one which belongs to a is not mapped to anything, so it cannot be a function. All right, and how about this? Suppose that we have a binary relation here where 1 is mapped to A, 2 is mapped to A. Is this a function? Uh, I don't remember. Well, it is a function. It is. <laughs> Even though 1 is mapped to A and 2 is mapped to A, right, it still fits the definition. All we need is that each element of A is mapped to one element of B, right? The fact that one is mapped to A and two is mapped to A does not contradict this. So it is a function, okay? Now consider this uh, binary relation defined on real numbers by just squaring this real number. So we have S of X is equal to X squared, okay? In Python, we can produce the graph of this thing. Is this a function? Well, indeed S is a function because to each x, and you can see for each x on the x-axis, if we go up from the x-axis, we hit one and only one point. Right, so if we go from the x-axis, it's just one point here, so it is a graph of a function. Right, and we go here, again, any x we pick, we go up or down, we hit exactly one point. All right, that's why it is a function. Now, what about we try to define a function on real numbers to real numbers by taking the square root of, the, of this number. 
Does this define a function? Maybe we see the graph. Well, the graph is, there is actually a problem. I cannot even plot the graph because for, you know, we're trying to define a function from real numbers, right, which includes the negative real numbers, right? We can see them on this graph here. So these are all the negative real numbers. Can we obtain a square root of a negative real number without going into complex numbers, right? Forget about complex numbers. We are interested in it. We are claiming that this is a function from real numbers to real numbers. The fact is, square root is not going to be a real number for a negative real number, right? I mean, there is no such thing as a square root of minus 2. Well, there is, but it's not a real number, right? Therefore, there is a problem with, it, with this definition. It doesn't work. You remember where I said for every element of this set, there must be an element here, right? Okay, so this doesn't work, right? Because this definition only works for non-negative real numbers. Um, So we can try to redefine it. How do we redefine it? Well, one way is to define it in this way. It will be a function. If instead of going from R to R, we go from non-negative R to R, right? Um, so we, we say it's going to be a function from the set of non-negative real numbers to the set of real numbers. Right, then, then this will work, right? And this is the graph that we get in this case, right? And it is, you know, if we restrict it, yes, it does work because we get for every x in our set, which we now have replaced with non-negative real numbers, we get exactly one point, right? So this, this is now a function, okay? We are about to conclude the lecture with a few key ideas from functions. Functions are very important. Now the image of a set under a function, right, is going to be the set of those values. So if it's a function from, from x to y, the image of a certain subset of x called a is the set of all those elements of y such that um, there, um, y is equal to, some, to f of x for some x belonging to a. That is going to be the image of this of this set. Um, a related idea is that of pre-image or inverse image. So if we again have a function from x to y and b is a subset of y, the inverse image of this b is going to be the set of those x elements of set x such that um, f of x belongs to b. Okay, This is best demonstrated by examples again. The inverse image Right, the inverse image, well, let's go back to our function which is x squared, right, which is just squaring the number, right, the inverse image of the set 4, consisting of a single element 4, is going to be the set minus 2 and 2, because minus 2 squared is 4 and 2 squared is 4, and that's it. The inverse image of the set 4 and 9 is going to be the set consisting of minus 3 because minus 3 is 9, minus 2 because minus 2 squared is 4, um, 2 squared is going to be 4, and 3 squared is going to be 9. And that's, that's it. That's the inverse image of the set for 9. Okay. Uh, the inverse image of A union B is equal to the F, the, to the inverse image of A union with inverse image of B. The, there are some nice set theoretic results for um, images and in inverse images. The inverse image of A intersection B is going to be equal to F to, to inverse image of A intersected with inverse image of B. Now how do you prove these? The same way as you prove De Morgan's laws, right, in the previous exercise that we considered. You show that this is a subset of this, and this is a subset of this, therefore the two are equal. Um, the inverse image of A intersection B is just the intersection of the in inverse images of A and B. The 
image of A union B is just the union of the inverse Im of the images sorry of A and B. And this would be really beautiful if also the image of A intersection B were the intersection of the images of A and B. But is this true? It happens to be false. In general, the image of an intersection of two sets is not the same as the intersection of um, of these uh, of the images of these sets under under a particular function f, right? Now, how do we prove that? How do we actually check this? Now, we're going to introduce another very powerful proof technique. It's proof by counterexample. We're going to find a counterexample that demonstrates that this is not true. So we do this by finding a particular example, right? So can, suppose that um, we consider some func the function from the Cartesian products r by r to r, okay, which is mapping these pairs, because you remember Cartesian pro products is the set of pairs where both elements are in r. It, it, it is a projection, so it takes the pair x, y and just maps it to x, so it's the projection on the x plane, right, and the first, and the first onto, the, onto this coordinate, onto the first, on the x plane. Okay, so we take any, any pair x, y is mapped to just x. Okay, now let us define A uh, as the set x, comma, 0, right, so it's just the pairs with 0 in the second coordinates. We define B as the set of pairs with one in the second coordinate, right? Then clearly these sets do not intersect. They either have zero or one in the second coordinate, right? And there is no intersection, right? So the intersection between these sets is, is, is the empty set, right? Which is denoted like this. Um, however, the images of these two sets coincide, right? The images of these two sets will be the same. Uh, so we have just shown that the image of the intersection we have disproven because this is actually an empty set it's not equal to the intersection of these they co co coincide so the intersection is just going to be equal to each of them and equivalently we have proven that the intersection of uh, the image of the intersection of a and b is not equal to the image of a intersected with the image of b now we have proved this by finding a particular example where this doesn't work Right, and this is called proof by counterexample. Another very powerful proof technique, very powerful technique in mathematics. One to one onto bijections and inverse functions. A function f from x to y is called injective or one to one if each possible element y of y of its codomain y is mapped to, at mo to is mapped to by at most one element of x. Right, it's, it's then one to one. It is, it's also known as injective. Um, it's onto or surjective if each possible element of y is mapped to by at least one argument x. We call this function surjective or surjections. And it is bijective it's, if it's both one to one and onto. Right, then we call it a bijection. A function f from x to y is invertible if there is a function from y to x such that it undoes the effect of this function, such that g of f of x is equal to x. So it inverts the effect of this function. Now, um, a function is going to be invertible if and only if, it is, if, if it's a bijection. So now let us check. Suppose that we have again our sets A and B, A with elements 1 and 2, and B, A, B, C. Um, is this function defined by this graph or this table, one is mapped to B, two is mapped to A, is it one to one onto a bijection? Is it invertible? Well, now let me help you on this one. Okay, now is it one, is it first of all one to one? There is a single element of A that is mapped to the element of B. No other element is mapped to B. Um, there's only one element that is mapped to A, which is 2, so it is 1 to 1. Is it onto? Well, it is not onto because there is nothing that is mapped by, uh, onto C, to C, 
right? So C does not occur here, so it cannot be onto. Is it a bijection? Well, no, because it needs to be both one to one and onto, and we have just seen that it is not onto. Therefore, there is no way to invert this function, so it is not invertible. All right, so one to one, yes, onto, no. Therefore, it's not a bijec bijection, therefore, it is not invertible. Next, let us look at this function, alpha, from A to B, the same set, defined by this graph or this table. One is mapped to A, two is mapped to A. Is it one to one? Well, it's not, because to A we have, we have mapped both one and two. That's right. Is it onto? No. It's not onto either, because nothing is mapped to B or to C. So it's not onto. There's no chance that it can be a bijection or invertible, you see. So it's not one to one, it's not onto, therefore it's definitely not a bijection, therefore it's not an invertible function. Now, for any, is there actually any bijection between the sets one and two and ABC? Is there any one to one and onto function between them? Well, since they contain different number of elements, it is not possible. Right, therefore, you cannot construct an invertible function between A and B. Right? Um, now, if you consider sets C and D, C consisting of elements 1 and 2, and D consisting of elements A and B, and suppose then what are the possible bijections? They're going to be one map to A, two map to B, that's one of them. Uh, we'll call it beta. Um, its inverse function is just going to undo its effect. It's going to map A to 1 and it's going to map B to 2. So that's the first bijection. It's 1 to 1 and onto, and it's invertible. So we can go back and, and, and reverse its effect. And the other bijection between sets 1 and C, C and D is gamma, which is going to map 1 to B and it's going to map 2 to A. That's the only other bijection. There are only two bijections between these sets. Um, and its inverse is going to map A to 2, and it's going to map B to 1. Mm -hmm. Okay, so since gamma is a bijection, so is its inverse. So the, in, the inverse um, is also going to be a bijection, therefore it's also going to be invertible, and the inverse of the inverse is just the original function. Yeah. And this is the last section. When we started talking about set theory, we said that this is the most fundamental, um, uh, the most fundamental, if you like, part of mathematics. Right? We, were, we started talking about sets, but then implicitly we introduced some notions, such as ordered pairs, which didn't seem to be sets. Now, if set is the most basic unit of mathematics, then kind of everything is a set. Now, can we represent, so this is an ordered pair, so because it's ordered, the ordered matters, right? The ordered pair AB is not the same as the ordered pair, pair BA. How can we represent it as a set? Because in sets, the order of elements does not matter. Here is the trick. We can use Kuratowski's definition, and we can define ordered pairs, AB, as sets consisting of the singleton set A and the set AB, right? Even if A is equal B, this definition still works. So, in fact, an ordered pair can be under the hood defined by a set. So we can represent ordered pairs as sets, you see? And there is no swapping B and A, because if we swapped B and A, we would obtain a different set here we would obtain a set, cons uh, a set of consisting of the set singleton set B, and again A and B, but it wouldn't be equal. It wouldn't have the same elements as this, you see? So we can use sets to define ordered pairs. And triples can be defined as, you know, ordered triples can be defined as ordered pairs, where the second element is actually the pair B and C. So we can, again, use this definition to define this as a set. So everything, an ordered pair is a set. Now, what about numbers? Surely numbers cannot be defined as sets. Well, we can define the natural number zero as the empty set. We can define one as the set containing the empty set. 
right? We can define two as the set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set. We can define three as the set containing the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and also containing the set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set. And in this way, we can, we can, we can define numbers as sets as well. And then we can expand, basically we can apply set theory uh, using something known as the dedekind piana axioms to obtain all the laws of arithmetic. So in fact we can, if we are crazy enough, do arithmetic in terms of set theory. This brief section at the end has been used to demonstrate that we can obtain effectively the rest of mathematics in terms of set theory. This is why set theory is so important. So when you're doing mathematics, you can't not do set theory. This concludes our lecture. Thank you very much. We will look at other fundamental ideas in mathematics that underlie machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these ideas in mathematics will be the next set of ideas that we need to reconsider really are linear algebra and probability theory. Thank you ever so much for listening.